And you already introduced your colleague, Raymond Skifelis from uh, Utrecht as well. And he will speak about extravesicular uh, uh, vesicles and uh, uh, drug delivery. OK, thank you very much. Uh, for the introduction, indeed, it is about extracellular vesicles, so quite a bit more fundamental than up to now. Um, and uh, just as a short introduction, what are extracellular vesicles? Uh, they're primarily composed of two kinds. Uh, the ectosomes, or microvesicles, as they're often uh, referred to nowadays, they are shed from the cell membrane of, uh, of the cell. And there's also uh, an e another class that is formed by invaginations of membrane into multivesicular bodies. And these multivesicular bodies, upon fusion with the cell membrane, release a whole bunch uh, of these uh, vesicles, and they are known as exosomes. But they're both submicron vesicles, and they're difficult to distinguish from one another. So in the end, we call them extracellular vesicles. Um, and extracellular vesicles essentially contain all biomolecules that can be found in and on a cell. So there are cell surface proteins, but there are also cytoskeletal proteins, uh, and also nucleic acids, so messenger RNAs, DNA fragments, pre-microRNAs, microRNAs, long non-coding RNAs, everything can be found in there. Um, and what's intriguing, of course, is the fact that they can be released from cells and um, that they are thought of as communicators between cells, not only locally, but even over a distance. So they could actually travel, and what, what people thought or assumed is that they might fuse or interact with the a target cell, be taken up, and then these biomolecules, which are often very difficult to deliver with any of the conventional delivery systems that we have, uh, might be functionally delivered in a, in, a, well, in a more elegant way, you could say. Um, an important step forward was um, uh, taken by the group of Matthew Wood, and they used dendritic cells that they isolated from a mouse, and then they have these den dendritic cells, and they transfected these dendritic, dendritic cells with a plasmid, containing a protein fused to a targeting peptide for the blood-brain barrier. So what these cells start to make is extracellular vesicles, which on their surface have a protein, that protein that is always sorted into these extracellular vesicles, and on the surface is um, uh, a targeting peptide for the blood-brain barrier. In the next step, they load the extracellular vesicles with the cargo, in this case an siRNA, and the trick they used uh, for that is electroporation. So they, uh, they, they um, uh, create gaps in the membrane, the sRNA can go in, and then you have your loaded molecule that was injected intravenously, crossed the blood-brain barrier, and then silenced an Alzheimer protein. So, well, it's, it's everything you could want of, an, uh, of a delivery system. And how they uh, checked whether the, uh, the sRNA was inside, and that was one of the steps that we were intrigued by, um, is the fact that they added fluorescently labeled siRNA to the extracellular vesicles, uh, and then they, uh, they electroporate it, and if you electroporate, you can pellet the fluorescence together with the vesicles, so it seems to be on the, uh, on the inside. And if you do not electroporate, you have a pellet, but the, uh, the fluorescent sRNA stays in the solution. So we uh, started to investigate that, um, and we, uh, we investigated the cargo loading, and indeed it seemed to work. Uh, before electroporation, you cannot pellet the fluorescent, in this case red fluorescently labeled sRNA, and if you electroporate, then all of a sudden you have a punctuate pattern of fluorescence here in the, in these, uh, uh, in the, in the bottom of the, of the tube. Um, so that was interesting, and then my uh, PhD student did an additional experiment, uh, and he also included a control, namely do not add any extracellular vesicles, but still electroporate. And then actually we got the most of the highest recovery of fluorescently labeled siRNA. So that was a bit peculiar. And even if you add more extracellular vesicles, actually the encapsulation efficiency went down, whereas we would have expected that it went up. So that was puzzling for quite a while. Uh, and then we stumbled upon uh, this, uh, this paper, which was actually quite old. Um, but that showed that actually the release of metal ions from the electroporation cuvette can induce precipitation with proteins with DNA, but also with RNA. So instead of loading your siRNA into the extracellular vesicles, you're actually creating a precipitate of metal ions together with the RNA of interest. Um, and indeed, that's, uh, that's what, you, what you see. If you chelate the, uh, the metal ions with EDTA, for example, and now you electroporate in the presence of EDTA, uh, then you don't see any encapsulation efficiency anymore, and you also do not observe the punctuate fluorescence anymore. And if you switch to polymeric cuvettes, uh, then you don't have any metal ions there whatsoever. Um, then you see that with the aluminum uh, cuvettes, 
you have a large number of particles, but these, these are in majority the new precipitates that are formed from the metal ions with the RNA, um, because you lose these particles if you electroporate in the polymeric cuvettes, and also you don't see any RNA the moment that you start, uh, start uh, using the polymeric cuvettes. So, um, well, you could argue that this is a one step back at least. <laughs> so I promised you two steps forward, one step back. Well, there's a one step forward uh, also. Um, and I should really give credit to the Van Rene lab with whom we collaborated because they thought of this elegant method to show functional transfer of messenger RNA uh, actually even in vivo. Uh, and it's based on this Cree recombinase expressing cell. And the Cree recombinase expressing cell will first of all make Cree messenger RNA that is translated into Cree recombinase. And that protein immediately goes back into the nucleus because that's, that's where it's supposed to act. It is a high affinity for DNA. But the Cree messenger RNA is, is around, and part of the Cree messenger RNA will actually be encapsulated inside the vesicles. Uh, and the beauty of Cree recombinase is that when it recognizes specific sequences in the DNA, it excises them out. Um, so what happens is that if Cree recombinase messenger RNA loaded vesicles are taken up by a cell, and this cell is engineered to have a red fluorescent protein and a stop codon between lock sites, this red fluorescent protein will be cleaved out, and if it's followed by a green fluorescent protein, now the cell will turn from red to green. So the arrival of Cree recombinase um, will, be, uh, will be followed by a color change of the cell from red to green. And now we can follow how efficient the pro process is, whether it happens at all. Um, so that's, uh, that's the system that we used. Well, first of all, some characterization events. Uh, these are the vesicles as they appear under the electron microscope, and they are about 100 nanometers in size. If we do Western blot, we see an abundance of CD63, one of the proteins that is often found inside vesicle preparations, uh, but we do not find, as expected, the Cree recombinase as a protein, because it's a nuclear protein, it binds DNA, it's never in, in, in the vicinity where vesicles are being made inside the cell. Um, what we do see is the messenger RNA for Cree recombinase, that is recovered inside the vesicle fraction. Uh, and what we also see is that the extracellular vesicles, and these are just, these are, this has nothing to do with the red fluorescence or the green fluorescence. This is just labeled vesicles, um, and it shows that they are taken up by cells. So um, the vesicles, nanovesicles are there, contain Cree messenger RNA, and they are taken up by cells. And if we then use a transwell system, so we have the acceptor cell in the top well, and then we have submicron um, uh, filter, and then in the bottom well we have the acceptor cells, uh, the red fluorescent acceptor cells that turn green if Cree messenger RNA arrives and is successfully delivered. In a, a range of different acceptor cell types, we see if the, uh, or the upper well does not contain the Cree recombinase producing uh, uh, cells, of course no color change, but here you see that the cells turn green. So indeed there is functional transfer of the messenger RNA through the um, uh, through, the, uh, through the filter. And that differs quite a lot between different cell types. Here the efficiency is less than 1%, but here it's almost up to 5%. Um, and that can also occur in vivo. This is uh, implantation of a tumor, of the uh, producing tumor, the, uh, the, uh, the donor tumor, uh, tumor cells. They are, in these cases, they are uh, uh, blue labeled. Um, and also the acceptor cell locally implanted within the tumor. So here, if the Cree recombinase uh, uh, producing cells are not there, they stay red, of course, but here you see the appearance of green cells also in vivo, when the tumor cells are mixed. Um, next question was, will these, um, these um, extracellular vesicles, um, will they also transfect or, or interact with other cells from the host, basically. So we injected Cree recombinase B16 melanoma cells into a tomato expressing mouse after a stop codon. So if the stop codon between lock sites is cleaved out, the cells will turn red. And in all tissues that we examined, we saw, for example, in the tumor, a host cell that has come there and has turned red, so has taken up the Cree recombinase. Um, but we also saw that in the lung, in lymph nodes and the spleen, for example. And we see that, well, they, they are from a different range of, uh, of, of cell types. They are CD45 positive, negative, F480 positive, and GR1 
positive. So it's a different kind of set of, of cells that are responsible for the, uh, for the functional uptake of Cree recombinase messenger RNA containing vesicles. Um, next step, the other way around. Now we have Cree recombinase expressing mice in all their cells. They have Cree recombinase. Um, and we have a tumor that has, uh, again, the, uh, the red fluorescent protein between lock sites, so it will turn green if any of the host cells will interact with the tumor cell and will deliver Cree recombinase. And also there, we see sometimes it's not a very efficient process. Apparently, the transfer from a tumor to host cells or to other tumor cells is far more efficient than the other way around, from host to tumor. Uh, but we see, and this is, uh, we see that in every slide, at least one, um, cell uh, that turned that turn green. Um, finally, also over a distance, we see the same phenomenon occurring. So we saw already that if we implant the tumor cells locally, they turn from red to green, but also if they are implanted in different flanks. So we have the Cree recombinase expressing tumor in one flank and the acceptor tumor in the other flank. And actually, then you also see these green cells appearing, albeit that the efficiency is a little bit lower, which might be expected. Um, what is interesting is that you can also now analyze what has changed next to the arrival of the, of the Cree recombinase. They turned green, but of course, next to the Cree recombinase, there's a whole lot more arriving uh, in that package. There are microRNAs, there are proteins, and they are coming from actually a very, uh, very aggressive cell line. In this case, this is the donor cell, and that cell line is very active and very, uh, very involved in, in movement. And these are the benign, you could say, red cells. But the moment they turn green, they start moving about a little bit more. So next to the arrival of Cree recombinase, they also uh, move a little bit more. They are more or less uh, a little bit more metastatic. And when I first saw these data, I said, well, you must be disappointed to uh, Jaco. But then he said, well, in metastasis field, apparently this is quite a substantial increase. And actually, when we investigated this more closely in a metastasis model, so here we have the Cree recombinase uh, uh, producing tumor cells and the reporter cells, again, locally implanted. But we look at the tumor and we look at the foci of metastasis and then evaluate, did there, were there more red or more green cells that metastasized? So if they uh, took up the Cree recombinase and turned green, they also got more of the metastatic signature of the, uh, of the donor cell. And would that also result in a higher, um, a higher number of green cells that metastasized to the lung? And you see that indeed, if you look at the ratio of red over green, that on average you're 50 fold higher with a, a local implantation of, the, uh, of the, both tumor types, but it can reach up to 200 fold more green cells within one focus uh, compared to the, green, to the red ones. And even with distant communication, difference is about uh, 10 fold, still substantial, but it also reaches up to 150 fold more green cells in certain foci compared to the red cells. So, in conclusion, I think this is, again, one step forward. Exogenous loading of biologicals is still difficult. Engineering cells to express desired biologicals in an extracellular vesicle is possible, and they can functionally transfer these biologicals, changing the recipient cell phenotype in vitro, in vivo, and even over a distance. Um, and these are the people involved. Um, this is the electroporation story, together with the University of Ghent. Uh, these are the people in my lab, and Matthew Wood, he, uh, we acknowledge that <laughs> it might be wise to, uh, to investigate this matter further. Uh, and Anouk Sommer, Jacob van Reen are the prime uh, people involved in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, the uh, uh, Cree recombinase story. And the funding uh, was obtained by the uh, European Research Council. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, nice and very clear presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. We are able to take some questions. Well, if this is not the case for the while, I have a burning question. Sure. Uh, if you do the exosomal transfer, for example, of Cree recombinase, yeah. and you have your green cells, yeah. you're not able to see for how long the effect is lasting because the no. manipulation is irreversible, so True. to say. True. Yeah. Do you have any other data indicating to you how long um, the RNA would be persisting or? No, no, no. Sorry, I know that would be real speculation. No, it's 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 indeed. It's it's uh, you only in principle need one ev one event, successful event occurring, and then um, then it's irreversible indeed, as you say. So it's 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 looking back in time, but there's no way of seeing changes or gradual. Uh, 
loss of the activity again. Yeah, because a kind of important point uh, might certainly be if uh, metastatic mRNA or microRNA, whatever, mm -hmm. is transferred or protein, it would, of course, have a, a limited half-life in the um, yeah. recipient cell. Yeah. And the question is whether this half-life or half-time is, is sufficient in order to induce effects in terms of metastases, for example, yeah. in the yeah. end. Um, th there was a recent study by the group of David Leiden that seems to indicate that, indeed, it, it has a very important function in metastasis and sort of prepares the, 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 the distant tissue for arrival of the, well, perhaps cancer stem cells or the, 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 the tumor cells, at least. Um, so from that perspective, they seem to be very important. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to assess. And, and based on, if you, if you isolate these vesicles and then re-inject them, almost invariably, they're very rapidly cleared by liver and spleen. So very little arrives outside liver and spleen macrophages. Um, so indeed, you need to pass a certain threshold, might be to, in order to observe effects in other tissues than the, the macrophage. Of course, the one point is the question of the physiological levels, which maybe is not necessarily relevant if you want to use it for drug delivery, which is a different ballgame. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but, but of course, you can uh, also imagine that uh, some epigenetic modulators are delivered, and that actually makes yeah. the long-lasting changes yeah. in the yeah, target cells. Definitely. And uh, yeah, up to now, every biomolecule that people have looked at has been recovered. So, <laughs> so there is at least a chance for that. Again. Definitely, yeah. No more? Okay, no, oh, Simon, please. Um, I'm guessing that some of the cells will be probably more productive in terms of, of uh, yeah. producing more vesicles than other ones. Yeah, definitely. So what are your experience on that? Um, it can differ about a hundredfold, basically. So from a couple of hundred uh, vesicles per cell per 24 hours uh, to a couple of hundred thousand, even. Yeah. Some, some, of some cell types, especially after stimulation or after stress, that seems to indicate, especially the microvesicle release, exosome release is rather constant. Uh, Always thing. Cells. No, 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 no. So no, it's also different between different cell lines, and it's also yeah. So and anything goes <laughs> basically. But after stimulation, it always goes up. So well, that's that's at least one thing that we know. Okay, then thank you again okay, for the nice you. presentation.